Welcome to Data Skeptic Time Series. This is Data Skeptic Time Series, the podcast about how to predict the future based on historical sequential data. Episode number. Everything starts with data. That's a quote from today's guest, Baman Rostami Tabar. He's the creator of Forecasting for Social Good, an organization that trains other organizations on how to better leverage the data they have with forecasting techniques that can be applied towards social good efforts. We talk about his academic background, the trainings he's been leading, and where Forecasting for Social Good can make great contributions. My name is Bahman Rostami Tabar, and I'm a senior lecturer in management science at Cardiff University. Well, my background, I'm an industrial engineer, so I did my bachelor and master in engineering, and then I did my PhD in the same area, industrial engineering, but with a bit more focus on forecasting, and in particular, in my PhD, I was focusing on forecasting using temporal aggregation, which is a sort of like a data transformation approach. So you have the time series of the data, you take them, you transform them to different time granular, and you will see whether this data transformation will improve the forecast accuracy or not. And following that, I did a postdoctoral in Paris, in France, I call Central Paris, and I work with a company called Forestia for about 18 months. And then I joined academia as a lecturer in Coventry University in the UK. And then since 2016, I'm working as an academic at Cardiff Business School, Cardiff University in the UK. So I know from reading your paper that you're familiar with the field of operations research, but I suspect a lot of my listeners won't be, even if there's a, you know, a great deal of overlap between what OR is and some of the techniques they might call data science or something like that. Could you share a high-level perspective on what operations research is? Well, operations research, I mean, forecasting, some people may consider forecasting as a part of operations research or not, but operations research is sort of tools and techniques, I would say, they are there for thinking about helping decision makers to make better decisions. And the tools could be actually based on like mathematical statistics or could be based on like soft tools as well, just like a simple diagram, which people may call it uh, soft operations research. Well, it makes sense to try and inform your decisions based on data and especially forecasts. Can you expand a little bit on how organizations do that? Uh, Once they have a time series in hand, how does that lead to some executive decision that needs to be made? In general, people consider a forecasting process and decision-making process. So in a forecasting process, uh, while you deal with all this, you know, data preparation, time series analysis, and then applying a forecasting model, the training the model and then generating the forecast and then of course evaluating it how good it is and then when you are comparing among tools of forecasting model you decide which one you have you use to inform the decision making so the forecast in general could be as a form of like a point estimation or it could be in the form of a prediction interval or it could be a probabilistic distribution as well and normally this would be the end of like the forecasting process and the beginning of a decision making process now a decision maker should look at this forecast ideally i would say as a form of probability distribution and then based on this make a decision that minimizes the risk while well, depending on the context what the risk is there And the paper I originally discovered that got us in communication was titled Forecasting and Its Beneficiaries, which I certainly want to unpack. But from reading it, it appears this is a chapter in a book. Could you tell me a little bit about the bigger picture, what project you're working on? So, well, this chapter is from a handbook of operations research. I think still they are editing this handbook of operations research. I know one of the editors, which is Professor John Boylan from Lancaster University. So I was invited to contribute to this handbook of operations research. And because the handbook is about operations research, I was trying to do something that has been actually discussed a lot in operations research related to beneficiaries of operations research, you know, uh, for organizations, benefits of operations research for organizations. And then I was looking at this from the forecasting perspective. So how organizations can benefit from forecasting, what are the barriers, and then what are the beneficiaries of forecasting? Well, let's open that up. Can you give me maybe some examples? I can see where the stockholders might be the beneficiaries of something a company does. Who else benefits? 
Well, we can in general, I think, consider indirect uh, beneficiaries. Well, for example, I can give you an example in, let's say, uh, emergency department in a hospital. So when you generate forecast for uh, emergency department in hospital, well, generally uh, direct beneficiaries are, let's say, managers and planners and decision makers that use that forecast to make planning. Right. And if the planning is done well, then patients that come to that particular emergency department, maybe they will wait less and then they get better service. And those patients could be indirect beneficiaries of forecasting in that case. Yeah, it seems like it could be a big win all around. Obviously, the patients benefit. Maybe the staff who isn't as stressed with unpredictable things benefits and standard of care. It seems like a win-win all around. How would a hospital get started on a project doing something with forecasting like this? Of course, everything would start with data. I mean, hospitals in general, they have a good record of data and, you know, they have IT services and then they have also data analysts in general. So they can access the data within the organizations, I think, easily. And the data analysts can produce the the forecast they need. And there are many, many different tools they may use in a hospital. So generally, they take the data, they prepare it for the forecasting, which they look at if there is any missing value, if there is any, you know, repetition or duplications of values just to make sure the data is quality and following that they just use the software applying a forecasting model and then produce it as a forecast that could be shown to a decision maker but I don't know whether the hospitals they really use this because in many cases it will just stay as a forecast that is shown to a manager but is not like an automatic process which you might think it should be because you can fit this into an algorithm that say for the planning or rostering or scheduling and the algorithm can do it but in many places is not just like that why is that it seems like if you've got a good solution and it demonstrably works and if the input data was okay you should be able to empirically say the advantage unless it's you know some very small improvement that's not worth it it would seem people should be picking up these uh, approaches and and suggestions from forecast and applying them in their operations. Do you have a sense of what barriers exist preventing people from doing that adoption? I think the first barrier could be related to how forecast is understood. So people in general understand forecasting as just a point estimation. Like you tell people tomorrow you're going to have 400 patients in your admission service. But the reality is that just the best guess and there are variations around this. And if those variations are not understood or not communicated with the decision maker, then if the decision maker or planner will base the planning on point estimation that it will be wrong. And after a while, they will lose the confidence because they say, well, we don't trust these numbers because they are wrong. But the reality is the understanding of the forecasting is wrong because it's not just a point estimation. At least that point estimation should be accompanied by a prediction interval or best by a probability distribution. I think so that's what I see is one of the most important barriers. But there are others as well. You know, when people, they produce the forecast and they want to put in an algorithm, the algorithm sometimes might not be flexible to, you know, last minute changes, which is happening all the time in practice. And again, because this is not happening, people sometimes they don't use algorithms and then they prefer just, I don't know, to have a Excel spreadsheet and run the planning manually instead of relying on algorithm that is not flexible. Well, it seems rather obvious to me, giant corporations and large organizations, just by their sheer size, they probably have internal capacities, you know, not just the analysts and the, that sort of thing, but the engineers and the operations people to take advantage of all this. It truly requires a team in a lot of cases. How does that work as we look down in the long tail of companies and organizations? As we consider smaller and smaller size firms, are they able to effectively leverage techniques I think small size companies or in general, maybe organizations in public sector, or I would say in general, organizations in poor resource countries like low and lower income countries, in general, they benefit less from this because the lack of resources and resources, again, could be people or could be, for example, hardwares or softwares or whatever they need for doing this, but also the lack of expertise to be able to take the data and then produce the forecast that is required for decision making. So big corporations benefit more from this, but as we go down, you know, the tail, I think there is less benefit for the organizations because of the lack of resources or lack of expertise.
When it comes to resources, I mean, on the bright side, I can say that I've seen more and more software go open source. Today, we live in kind of a great period of time compared to the recent past where it was a lot of things you had to get a license for or whatnot. Even though some of those things still exist and maybe there's a good reason to use them, there's plenty of free software. But as you say, not a lot of free hardware floating around to use, so there's a cost there. How has open source and that sort of thing evolved access to taking forecasts and using them in your decision making? You know, I'm involved in a project that is called Democratizing Forecasting, and that project aims at basically teaching in developing countries. So we teach forecasting, you know, to people. We go to universities or other institutions. And I do the same sort of workshops with other organizations with social missions, I would say, like, for example, health services. And I can say that open source revolutionized this process, really. So now I use open source, you know, to teach people. So they don't need to pay for any software. They simply can download and install the software and they can use this. So I think this is a a huge advantage. And of course, it will impact also the use of forecasting in organizations as well. But on the other side, if you look at it, it could be also dangerous because people can easily, you know, download the software, a package, apply it to a data, and then, you know, they just use it. But sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes the data is changing. The method maybe is not actually adapting to this change. And then people, if they don't understand really what is going on behind the scene, they wouldn't be able to add value to the whole process. So I would say the forecasting process is not just, you know, taking these softwares and applying methods from these packages and then produce the forecast. I think there is the whole process they need to go through to make sure the forecasting process is done correctly. Can you talk a little bit about how the workshops you teach prepare people to do that? Basically, in the workshop, I'm using R as an open source software, but also I use open source books. And I think you have interviewed Professor Rob Heinemann. So I'm using a book written by Rob and George and Forecasting Principles, which is, again, based on R, but it is free and online, so people can access it easily as well. So my workshops are three days designed based on this book, because I know now people also can refer to the book after my workshop and learn more from the book as well. So the workshops are designed for three days. So in general, I start by discussing the link between forecasting and decision making. So why we do forecasting for decision making and the process of identifying the forecasting requirement. And that starts always from identifying at least one or multiple reasons why forecasting is required. What are the type of decisions that our forecast need to support? And from there, we come back and look at the different steps of forecasting process. And then we move on in particular to talk about background of forecasting models, uh, fitting models to the data, and also evaluating forecast accuracy. And we're using a real data set from a hospital. And in this workshop, basically, we train learners to become forecasters. So not the, in particular, the use or the consumer of the forecast, but those who generate or produce the forecast. And what's the general level of technical background people have when they sign up for the forecast? Do you need a lot of prerequisites to get started? Uh, Well, the prerequisite really is if they should know about statistics a little bit. Like, I don't know, if they should know what is a normal distribution. Uh, Otherwise, it would be very difficult. Apart from that, we don't really have any prerequisite because... We start from scratch because, as I said, I start from why forecasting is required. And then from there, we build step by step, collecting data, preparing data for forecasting, and up to the last one, which is communicating forecasting to decision makers. And could you tell me a little bit more about the organization you'd mentioned that manages and puts on these workshops? Uh, What's the mission statement and scope? So the organization sponsoring the workshops is International Institute of Forecasters. So basically, I'm like a member of uh, an institute. Well, I'm just uh, like a normal member. I'm not a board of directors or whatever. But basically, they are supporting, producing and distributing knowledge in the area of forecasting. So, you know, they have two journals, International Journal of Forecasting and, and Foresight, which is a practitioner journal. And they have a regular workshops and they have an annual 
the symposium, so International Symposium on Forecasting, which is organized every year. And yeah, because they want to support distribution of forecasting knowledge, I proposed this project and they were very happy to support it. Is there a particular type of organization you try and connect with, a place that you think, hey, we really want to give our workshops in places that have a special need or something along those lines? How do you decide where to spend your time? I think this is a question I have been thinking about as well. And of course, I think there are many organizations, they need more sort of support than others. As I said, maybe public organizations, they have less resources and less expertise comparing to big corporations. But in general, the mission of these workshops initially was to train people in developing countries. So our main focus was on uh, low and lower income countries. And I was selecting a country based on World Bank data from, you know, the list of low and lower income countries. And then I had to find a partner and the partner again could be a research institute or could be a university who is happy to organize the workshop, you know, in the country. And then we coordinate between us and I travel to the country and then I go and deliver the workshop for three days. The following message comes from Data IQ, the platform for everyday AI. The potential for positive change with AI is huge, but seeing the value is hard. It's about organizational transformation, not just technology. And today's businesses struggle with the complexities of bringing AI initiatives to fruition. That's where Data IQ comes in, bridging the gap between all of the challenges and tensions present to infuse a culture of working with data and AI every day and at every level of the company. Whether solving for the mundane, like automating forecasting, or what is the optimal number of widgets to buy, or undertaking moonshots that push the limits of today's technology to grow your organization and innovate. Join more than 45,000 people meeting worldwide across banking, insurance, pharmaceuticals, manufacturing, retail, and more, who are driving exceptional results with Data IQ. Visit dataiq.com to learn more. I'm Jeff Wheelwright, tech journalist and host of the ARM Viewpoints podcast. Along with ARM, the company whose technology sparked the mobile revolution, we're bringing you the latest from the heart of the tech world. I've had fascinating conversations with industry experts about topics ranging from AI and data security to the promise of 5G and the future of healthcare. And we're just getting started. Join us as we explore the evolving world of computing. Download and subscribe to ARM Viewpoints at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts. There are a lot of things that correlate with countries that are lower income and things like that. You know, generally there tends to be less infrastructure, maybe less data collected, that sort of thing. Do you face any unique challenges working with that category? Yeah, I think that varies a lot depending on the countries. So I have been in, in, you know, in a country, for example, I deliver a workshop in a room without any window. So clearly in that uh, institution, they, for example, they didn't think about how physical environment is important and how it impacts learning, for example. So that definitely is something that I could observe. In some countries, I saw, for example, internet connection issues that I didn't saw in others. So I think it depends in some countries, uh, that definitely there are issues more related to infrastructure. Because I mean, what I was looking for really is, you know, a physical environment, I would say, you know, a classroom with tables with a whiteboard and a good internet connection. And that was the only thing. So some institutions, they could provide this, but I think some, for some reasons, they failed. So of course, that's a problem in some countries. I'm not sure if you have a chance to keep in touch with a lot of the workshop attendees or not, but I'm curious if you know of any success stories of people who've come, learned some techniques and been able to put them into practice in an important and positive way. So I haven't actually kept in touch and the reason is I was the only one and you know this was a huge burden because I had to do everything from A to Z for the workshops on my own and I didn't have time to do the other things but now we are actually putting a team together 
and we have created a channel on Slack. And then now when we deliver the workshop, we invite people to join the Slack channel and then we can keep in touch with them, um, I'll support them probably more. And if they have anything, they can share there as well. But at the moment, I don't have any direct contact with attendees, unfortunately. But I have some like feedbacks from people attending the workshops and how actually it helps them to change the way they think about forecasting. And in particular, the link between forecasting and at least what I called social good or forecasting for social good was something they connect with. Let's unpack that. I think the phrase forecasting for social good is sort of intuitive. We all think we get what it means just from the phrase. But uh, when you really get down to brass tacks, what does it mean to be doing forecasting for social good? Yeah, the thing is, when we talk about forecasting for social good, as you said, maybe everyone has its own definition. But we have written a paper and it was published in International Journal of Forecasting just to define what we mean by forecasting for social good and what are the attributes of forecasting for social good process. So I define forecasting for social good based on four attributes. So it must be a real problem. It should help to make a better decision that prioritize thriving humanity over thriving economy. And it should enhance social foundations and ecological selling and impact you know, the public as a whole. So that is the definition for forecasting for social good that has these four attributes. Could you maybe put that in context? Do you have an example of a, maybe a use case or a particular organization doing something interesting that is a really good stellar example of what it means to be doing forecasting for social good under those criteria? Currently, I'm doing a literature review paper. I'm looking for cases where this has been done. It is actually a challenging thing, really, because here we talk about a couple of things. First of all, we talk about a real problem. So I'm looking at publications. So how we can detect a problem is real. Our definition of a real problem in the paper is a problem that deals with day-to-day experience of people and is a problem that someone can take an action on it. So it, it means it needs to have an organization involved in a project. So it needs a close collaboration between people to work something around this. So I don't have any example right now to give you, but I mean, you can think of many contexts or, or some disciplines in general, actually, they do forecasting for social good. If you look at the humanitarian, for example, area, if you look at the organization like United States Agency for International Development, if you look at the organization like Red Cross or National Health Services here in the UK, well, they use forecasting for the purpose of social good. And they're working with a real problem. For them, the priority is well-being of people. And they're trying to enhance, depending on, again, the organization, maybe a social foundation, I don't know, like health, again, well-being, maybe something related to food, or it could be also uh, something related to environmental, which could be, I don't know, CO2 emission or something like that. And in general, for example, in the context of uh, National Health Service or humanitarian, again, uh, what they care about is really the public as a whole. is not just one single organization or one single sector. So... In general, you know, if you look at the area of forecasting, so for a long time, the main focus has been on developing new methodologies uh, or techniques and tools. And the, the success, you know, of the whole forecasting process is generally assessed based on the forecast accuracy or using statistical error metrics. And if there is something just beyond this is, OK, they look how forecasting enhance profit, for example, how it help to make something more profitable. So there is less really attention beyond this. And that's what we, you know, in, in forecasting for social good, we just talk about a perspective. So we don't prescribe anything. We just try to say, well, this is an alternative perspective. So we should not only, you know, talk about forecasting accuracy, but go beyond it. And not only just going beyond it, but make sure you consider both social foundation and uh, ecological ceiling in this case. So it's a sort of a, like multi-array kind of variables. And this arrays should include social foundation and environmental ceiling or ecological ceiling. So. Makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, it's almost an embarrassing point for a practitioner to think like, oh, I've been so focused on accuracy. Why wasn't I considering more about the impact of what my forecast would do? I think maybe part of the answer is that it's easy to focus on accuracy. We have good software to do it 
good metrics, well understood procedures for how to refine our methods to get better accuracy or lower mappy or something like that. Is there a way from like a numeric perspective where I encounter those topics that I can somehow optimize or regularize for social good? Or does it exist at a more, I don't know, higher level of how it gets applied? Well, as I said, we provided just this perspective and then, uh, but I think if it needs to be um, operationalized, we need different metrics as well. So we don't really have one single metric. They say this is in a metric for forecasting for social good. As I said, in my opinion, it is a multi-array. When as a decision maker, you need to consider these multi-arrays and these arrays should include social foundation and ecological selling, but we don't really have one single one. And I agree completely with you. People, they don't do it because it's difficult, because sometimes it involves, you know, more, but it is feasible. And we have to push forward to get there because this is really where we see the value. So, you know, when we go beyond the the forecast accuracy, this is where you know, we see how forecasting could really add value to decision making. But if you just stop in the forecast accuracy, I can tell you in many cases, no one is going to use the forecast. But if you show them the impact and then how if they use method A, method B, method C, the decision they are going to make or the planning they're going to build might be different, then, you know, that something is relevant to them. They don't know what is root mean square error. Okay, if you presented them forecast accuracy at root mean square error, well, they don't know really what you're talking about. But if you show them something like, let's say, cost, like overtime, so how much time, for example, staff spend in the service that is considered as overtime. If you show them the impact in terms of the waiting time of patients, they understand this metrics very well. Ah, that's a great framing. Yeah, focus on the core deliverable metrics that affect the end users like that. Well, I'm curious if you think uh, or where your thoughts lie with regard to division of labor. I'm thinking of, to draw an analogy, in like the software world, if we're going to build a web application, programmers, I mean, they might know a little HTML, a little CSS, but they probably shouldn't be designing the layout of the site. That should go to a graphic designer whose tools are not, you know, Node.js, they're like Figma or Photoshop or things like that. And it's, it seems like in the web development world, we have figured out these different roles that people play and different hats you can wear. In the forecasting world, certainly a forecaster is someone that has to have mastery over the methods and the software. Do you think it's also that same person who should be pushing and advocating for the social good aspects and things like that? Or is this another type of professional, the way the graphic designer is different from the coder? Well, in my opinion, is the role of forecasters. And that's the problem, because so far, probably, as a forecaster, we tend to say our job is finished there. And then we leave it to a decision maker. And the decision maker, you know, it's a sort of like a gray area. They don't really understand this well, the, you know, this link between forecast and decision maker. But I think as a forecaster, we can push towards this, but definitely we need the collaboration, you know, a very close collaboration with the decision makers or with the decision making process in general, whoever is involved there because they know what they want exactly. They know how they make decisions because, you know, in many cases, the decision making might not be automatic. You know, it could be judgmental and the decision maker needs to look at the different metrics and based on make a decision, right? So I tend to say it is our role as a forecaster to push for this, but we need a strong collaboration with planners and decision makers to push this agenda forward. In that regard, do you have any advice on the communication front? If I'm a proficient forecaster who has come up with some good model or projection or something along those lines, and now I'm hoping that my results can impact my organization, but maybe it's a new thing, right? It was never a process anyone had before. Everyone always has a way of doing their job. Maybe they're stuck in their way. What are some techniques or advice you might give for someone who wants to be an advocate for pulling techniques in and having better impact? Well, in terms of the form, I think in terms of how we communicate with the decision maker, uh, technically, what I found, uh, of course, a very good visualization is always helpful. But what is, again, probably most important is the communication where is possible and where is relevant. It should be in form of a distribution. When I say in form of a distribution, it means you give the whole picture to a decision maker instead of just giving like an average of 
you know what is going on right so a form of like summarizing the result in a average don't know taking a median or whatever and then you present this to a decision maker i think as a forecaster we have to communicate the whole picture to a decision maker that enables making a decision i think that's one important thing and another thing is when we want to communicate uh, we need to think about it, this multi array so not only forecast accuracy maybe okay profit or cost is there but also we need to think beyond it whether there are other metrics related to the social foundation and environmental ceiling that probably we don't think about them immediately but we have to include them to make again a, a better decision yeah, I'm curious if we can expand on how one would do that, especially with social and environmental factors. You know, maybe I'm working on forecasts about what product we're going to launch or something like that. I may not have a total scope of how it will impact people or how it will impact the environment or things like that. I assume there are special steps that one should probably take in thinking that through. Do you have any thoughts on, you know, like a workflow or a flowchart or something like that on how I can assess if I have taken in the full perspective in, that I should have when doing some work? I think everything starts from, you know, identifying the list of decisions that forecasting is going to support. So if you identify the list of decisions and basically we identify reasons at least I would say one reason, and in many cases, many reasons why forecasting is required. And then depending on, you know, that list of decisions, you may have, you know, metrics, you can identify metrics. Sometimes metrics might not be even available. You may need to create them. And that's one challenge. So when we talk about forecasting for social good, I would say in some cases we have, you know, clear maybe metrics. In some cases we don't really. So again, we may need to create metrics to be able to link forecasting to decision making. But to start with, I should say identifying the list of decisions is the most important one. And following that, you can now define your forecast requirement. And again, the link needs really a strong collaboration between decision making process and forecasting process. So in general, these are not the same people. So these are different people doing, you know, the forecasting and then the decision making. But when we bring them together, I think it is a challenging topic. Well, to wind up, could we talk a little bit about resources? I know there are a lot of people out there who know the techniques and the methodologies. Maybe they could benefit from thinking a little bit more about the social good, but also there's maybe some energy from those uh, missing resources you mentioned that organizations don't have. Do you have any thoughts on how data scientists and OR people can volunteer and give back and that sort of thing? Well, we have a website. People can actually look at the website, uh, www f4sg.org so we run a couple of projects there and we organize an annual workshop on forecasting for social good as well so we have organized the workshop for two years now and this year would be the third year again in the workshop we have people from academia and practitioners from different organizations and all topics that we have or we cover in the workshop are all related to forecasting for social good. So I think that workshop would be maybe a great place to start and for people, you know, to join and to volunteer. And we are also trying to create a research network on forecasting for social good, just based on, you know, the people we have in the workshop. So every year around 50 people at least attend the workshop. So we want also, you know, to benefit from this and create a network where we can collaborate with organizations, create, you know, a platform for people to create, to work together there as well. But if, if you talk about forecasting for social good, they can go to the website, but attending the workshop, I think it would be very good for people, but also for us, because we need also, you know, more active people in this area. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Well, Bauman, I guess to wrap up, could you share some of your thoughts on where forecasting for social good is going? How are the impacts uh, that we're planting now going to be realized over the next 10 or 20 or so years? Well, I think some people, maybe they are doing it, but I don't think we, we are doing enough when it comes to the impact of forecasting on social and ecological selling. Because at the end of the day, uh, we put a lot of efforts in improving forecast accuracy, developing new methodologies, but 
if you know no one is really using this forecasting this doesn't have you know any value because you generate the forecast for what exactly so you want to make a better decision and i think this is just the start of this initiative and i think the collaboration is fundamental here because as i said we need real problem we need social and environmental or ecological impact so we need to bring people from the forecasting from data science from uh, modeling and also decision makers who are those who are going to use the forecasting together and hopefully this will help people to use forecasting for social foundation and ecological s- selling agenda but in general we have also developed a sort of like a simple framework where people can look at it so this is available in the paper and depending on you know their knowledge in the area of forecasting and how for example that knowledge has been used in the social good practices they can contribute to the agenda as well for instance if they have done a lot of work in other domains i don't know like load forecasting and they think the sort of techniques and tools they have used they could be very beneficial to humanitarian i don't know forecasting medical items for like warehouses in afghanistan in syria and in those countries while well, they can also contribute to this you know sometimes maybe also practitioners they do a lot of interesting work but they have never published it right so again we can also learn from those people especially you know in the area of humanitarian where i know they they do a lot of maybe judgmental forecasting where there is no statistical methods they just use you know judgments to make predictions and then use it to make decisions maybe we can also learn from them so learning from practice you know to inform maybe theories but also maybe there are areas where we still don't have the methodologies and then we can invent new methodologies to be used in the social good area so th- these are like research opportunities that you may have in this area and you know in the next 5 10 years i think this is what you want to focus on and push the agenda towards this well i like the vision a lot tom and where can people follow you online on twitter but i think all the information is available on the website that i mentioned as well on twitter is so b a h m a n underscore r underscore t this is my twitter account Sounds good. We'll have that in the show notes as well. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show and share your work. Thank you so much for inviting me. That concludes another installment of Data Skeptic Time series. Our guest today, Bamin Rostami Tabar. Thanks to our sponsors, Data IQ and Arm Viewpoints Podcast. Myself, Claudia Armbruster as associate producer. Vanessa Bly, guest coordinator, and our host, Kyle Polich.